want to welcome everyone to tonight's fundraiser in support of U.S. war resistors in Canada. In 2009, when Kimberly Rivera first faced the threat of deportation at the hands of the Conservative government, a powerful op-ed appeared in the Globe and Mail. It read, during the Vietnam era, the U.S. draft lottery meant that educated middle-class children were as likely to be conscripted as the poor, so that American outrage against the war cut across all social classes and the border with Canada too. Today, however, we can turn our gaze away and do so easily because the great majority of us have no immediate stake in the dirty work that is being done for us. Noah Richler wrote those words after attending an event much like this one in this same room in support of war resistors. His recently published book, What We Talk About When We Talk About War, argues that politicians, the military, and the media all use 9-11 and the war in Afghanistan to transform Canada into a warrior nation. We're very happy to have him with us here tonight. So please welcome Noah Richler. Hi, good to be here. You're lucky that I wasn't singing with that choir. I've <laughs> always wanted to be able to sing, but it doesn't come easily. Um, first of all, um, uh, my heart goes out to the uh, war resistors who are here tonight and others who've been sent back. Uh, I think it's very brave what's being done, and I'm very ashamed of where, how the country uh, has departed from previous ideas uh, at its most fundamental. It's just barbaric to ask anybody who doesn't want to to kill someone else, and there are plenty of people who will do the job, so it's hardly necessary as well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, our American, I hope soon to be Canadian pals, are pawns in a bit of a game that is being uh, played out, a very serious game, um, as a result of a very deliberate effort by uh, conservatives and the right that has been actually remarkably successful over the last 10 years. But I don't actually need to tell you this. I think uh, I keep waiting for that prick Jason Kenney to be in the audience or some Tory or Rick Hillier or any one of these awful people to actually be in the audience brave enough to confront me. But of course, another tactic of um, the government we have is not to bother engaging with the, um, their opposition at all. Uh, in the part of Nova Scotia where I write a lot, um, a woman protested to the conservative MLA uh, MP there uh, about um, a federal issue and she was told um, by Greg Kerr, uh, it's a democracy, you're entitled to your opinion, which is of course fantastically patronizing because the uh, you know, rejoinder, unsated rejoinder that is, uh, and I couldn't be bothered. Um, I bring that up partly because I think that as people who are probably of a common mind here, it's very important, I think, for us to um, engage with uh, the Hilliers and Kennys and Ezra Levants and other buffoons um, who are trammeling the Canada that I think and hope and believe I that still exists but is just dormant for a while. I think there are many Canadians who just don't know quite how to speak and are sort of uh, waiting for this uh, alteration in the national character to um, turn around. But I think it, you know, getting towards that moment requires us actually to take on and, and be in discussion with people um, that we might not normally. The great blessing of Canada is also its curse, which is that we don't ever actually have to meet people we don't want to. Um, the original idea that led to the sponsorship scandal in Quebec was basically to get Canadians from all over the country to remind Quebecers how much we believe it should be a part of the country and ship them in, you know, with cheap airfares and the like, and that actually was not a bad idea at all. Um, but space provides us the opportunity not to have to, have, uh, not to, have to ever meet people we're not particularly interested in meeting. Um, so we need to make the effort, because that's the only way these changes will be undone, uh, especially as we're sort of acting in the wake of a, an ongoing failure of uh, liberal, or a small L, I mean by that liberal opposition as we used to know it. Um, I did, after the last uh, time I was here as a uh, member of the audience, 
um, phone up Michael Ignatieff myself and sort of ask him to do something about it. And he hummed and hawed and talked about uh, contracts and about our obligations to our allies and so on and didn't do anything. That was a, and as um, Christian, one of the war resistors here tonight, pointed out, he also left the room when a critical vote was um, taking place uh, in the House of Commons. Um, but we have to, you know, it was also, we have to stand up and we have to have a tenable position and in these insecure times, that may mean, uh, if only for advantage, um, at least showing that we're not sort of um, flower power, hippy dippy saps who have no idea of the real world, uh, and understanding that from time to time, wars may have to be fought. And if they are fought, they should be fought with um, gravity and lament. It was interesting hearing the, the Zulu song in there. I'm sometimes asked in the wake of the book that I published this year, um, what we talk about when we talk about war, if I ever believe there is a cause or there is something uh, called a just war. And of course, I think that the war against apartheid could probably be called that. It's also a war that was eventually uh, resolved um, through truth and reconciliation, through basically, in other words, a form of uh, engagement uh, rather than obliteration of, of the enemy. Um, this, the, the war that uh, in the Canadian, my book concentrates on, on the war in Afghanistan and how we talked ourselves into, through, and out of it. Uh, it is on sale out there, and I only say this because if you buy it, whatever difference between the, what um, Janet Goodfellow and co paid for it, uh, and you do, uh, will go to the war resistors, and not to me. Um, so maybe that will prompt you to have a look. Um, it was, prompt, it was uh, provoked in me by many things, mo mainly in a sort of anger at what was happening to the Canada that I was fortunate enough to have grown up in in the second half of the last century, which was an open and tolerant uh, society, one that uh, understood its place as a kind of a, uh, what you might call a refuge or a safe haven or a place of the second start as it was um, for so many and as it was for American Vietnam um, war resistors too. And um, I suppose what saves the book from being just a, um, uh, an irascible polemic is that I was at least open to the idea that I might have been wrong, that the Canada I was defending um, was the aberration and that the warrior nation that uh, we seem to have become was perhaps um, the thing that we'd always been. Uh, I needed to find some reason to believe that that wasn't so and uh, to understand why we might, to my mind, have been inclined to a certain kind of um, activity to peace operations um, alongside the occasional regrettable circumstance in which uh, um, a conventional war might need to be fought. And I, I, I think that there is that, um, uh, that there is something that explains that tendency, and it's basically uh, the knowledge that Canadians have of their own extraordinary good fortune, and that this extraordinary good fortune hasn't come to us by anything other than historical accident. Um, and that at our best, we understand that it's incumbent upon us to share or make that good fortune accessible to others. Um, that meant that I was able to look back on a century of wars and not as um, the so-called historians Jack Granitstein and David Berkson or uh, the reporters Christy Blatchford and DeMano, who aren't reporters of quality but who have fantastic platforms, um, not as they would have seen it, this sort of bellicose, fantastic nation punching above its weight, but rather one that has, over um, the course of several confrontations that weren't immediately our own, um, gone to bat for some greater idea of the common good um, and basically participated uh, in conflicts in which we had nothing immediately to gain, but we did so out of sympathy for other people in worse circumstances than ourselves. Um, I think that's still true. I, I, I've had a kind of a, it's only a book. I haven't run away from an army. Um, I haven't fought. It's a, um, as I say, it's only a book, but it's not been the easiest book to speak about. Um, and, but there, and there have been some interesting moments. And I did, for instance, um, share a stage with Captain Trevor Green, who was a reservist in the Canadian Army, um, in the Canadian Armed Forces, who was um, to remove his helmet for a meeting with tribal elders and was struck by a, um, uh, a young Afghan bearing an ax, and who, the, the ax cleaved the back of his head, and he really should not have lived, but did. 
um, mostly because of the insistence of a certain nurse that he had an opportunity, and then the extraordinary care of his wife, Debbie. Um, and I shared a stage with him in Vancouver with some trepidation, um, but not about to say no. Uh, and uh, he, like all, I can say categor categorically, all of the Canadian forces that I've uh, met, not a great number, but enough, um, I think was sympathetic to this idea that we're basically um, uh, out there to, f to um, make a difference and have some sort of um, humanitarian purpose. Uh, he wrote a column decrying what the Harper government was doing and its monolithic views uh, that interestingly wasn't published in a pa paper in his hometown of Vancouver, but in the Toronto Star, and it was very brave of him to have done so. And what he recognized, which I think we need to, is that this uh, war abroad has allowed all sorts of things to happen at home um, b by permitting our thinking in, uh, in the, um, of the world in black and white terms of uh, absolute good and evil of someone being a detestable scumbag or a monster, as Hillier would put it, and the rest of us uh, saintly and heroic and good. Um, that that uh, naive, um, mendacious um, portrayal of the world has had its extension here at home in many ways that are familiar to us. Um, it's on display constantly in um, the pronouncements of the 1950s primitive character, the Minister of Public Safety, uh, Vic Taves, who, for instance, when the, uh, he was combating the internet um, or trying to push uh, uh, an internet surveillance bill giving the police greater powers, when somebody objected to that, he said, as you'll remember, you're with the child molesters or you're against us. Um, um, sorry, you're, 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 you're with us or you're, you're with the child molesters, is how he put it, and therefore against us. Um, it's there in the language that was used to describe people who are merely environmentally concerns, concerned as eco-activists funded by foreign money, which uh, is exactly the same language that Vladimir Putin used to describe the three female members of the punk band uh, Pussy Riot, uh, but before he imprisoned them, which should give us pause. But, you know, the, I think the, the part of the, the problem is that moral indignation is almost too, and I'm speaking strategically here, uh, too easy to come by and not very useful, especially with a bunch that won't, um, as I say, engage. Um, you know, even yesterday when um, a member of uh, Harper's, you know, the gang of thugs on the th front bench, or it wasn't yet, uh, a couple of days ago, Peter Van Loan, house leader, you know, stormed across um, Duma style and was about to attack Nathan Cullen. And, you know, we can be sort of outraged, but it's, I almost yearn for the moment at which we might laugh at this bunch. Um, when Ignatieff, who did disappoint us, but who nevertheless represented a certain kind of hope, um, was painted as not, um, not coming back for you, perhaps the appropriate response to Harper, who was always very scared of the, of the Ignatieff who didn't show up, the very smart man, uh, would have been to turn to Harper in, in the House of Commons and say, I'm sorry, couldn't you get a job anywhere else? Uh, because Many Canadians do. We go abroad, we come back, and, and that would have undermined um, Harper, who hasn't had to contend with anything but a sort of flattering um, combination of indignation and outrage. And there are, there are opportunities for this. And we did have, um, we've, we've, we've got a prime minister now who behaves like a tin pot dictator from Africa from time to time. Uh, he was in the Arctic um, a couple of months ago, um, and to my, it's astonishingly, he was up there to announce uh, a sliver of land being made into a national park, less than Parks Canada was hoping for, and uh, also his funding of an expedition to find the uh, ships, lost ships of the um, 19th century explorer John, John Franklin, uh, who had lost his life and all those of his uh, cr crew trying to find a Northwest Passage, and he had the uh, JTF-2, the Special Forces, put on a little show for him uh, which is not sort of what we're used to doing. And the head of JTF2 explained that they were up north um, shadowing an ecotourism vessel possibly carrying um, uh, illegal migrants. Um, and this jolly exercise had everything in it that is actually laughable. Because really, if you think about it, if some um, detested Tamil migrant um, was up there in the Arctic and actually managed to make his way down to Toronto from a Calumet, he probably should have been given the Order of Canada. Um, 
and so and we need just that. We need to laugh at these people rather than allow them to get away with their demonization, for instance, of 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 the Tamils on the Sun Sea as terrorists jumping the queue, and we have a government that is facilitating uh, entry for the right people and, and leading them to the top of the line anyway. For $7,000, you can get a super visa and the like. Um, so uh, anyway, that, that's sort of the, um, I suppose I feel, let's work together and figure out a way to make these people ridiculous and get them out as soon as possible. They keep offering us opportunities um, I'm just going to read a couple of pages from the book, just as sort of a way of closing. Not a, c a couple of pages I've read before, um, and uh, partly because I want to recognize uh, the Americans here and a great conscientious objector, E. Cummings, um, and partly too because uh, this includes a, a passage from the Iliad. Uh, sorry, from the. Um, yeah, it's from the Iliad in which uh, uh, Hector comes back to his um, uh, ch wife and infant child uh, who bursts into tears. I'll read you the passage, and, I'll, and um, it's not terribly original for me to have chosen it. It's about war finding its way home and into the family, um, especially as we have to stay, you know, stay the course, says the language. Um, and in a book that really looks at how that language changes in order to permit our committing and staying on and getting out, how the war, for instance, is not a war in the first instance, because that means we have to recognize the Geneva Conventions and behave differently, and then it is a war, because there's no other way to explain the fact that we're still in it, and Canadians and Americans and Europeans and Afghans are dying. And then it becomes a mission, which is a kind of fantastic slate of hand, because a war is something that you win or lose, and a mission is something you merely begin and end. And so we've allowed ourselves, in effect, to leave this war and to forget about it. I, even I am stunned by how quickly we've generally forgotten about it. I don't mean we in this room, but how it's, it's been lost as a topic of conversation. There's still 700 Canadians over there, but even they aren't reason enough for, uh, maybe it'll start again with Don Cherry's ridiculous buffoonery, uh, you know, on, um, on Hockey Night in Canada and his maudlin stuff, maybe that'll pick up um, the interest. Anyway, uh, but of course there's a strike. Um, <coughs> As battle persists, distance is diminished, the pity of war finds its way home and risks unsettling a society's martial commitment. Our humanity comes to the fore, the painful recognition of war's nihilism, a phenomenon that has been revisited innumerable times over the course of the nearly three millennia that have passed since the seminal, unforgettable scene in the Iliad in which Homer describes the noble Trojan warrior Hector's return to his wife Andromache and their son Astyanax. The meeting is a lull in the unrelenting, savage stalemate of Troy's war with the Achaeans. Ten years of it already, Canada's turn in Afghanistan has come to be as long. And Hector's reunited family is a symbol of the peaceful and civilized life that the Trojans have been defending. Hector makes the mistake of appearing before his wife and child, still clad in full armor and the plumed helmet that he's not thought to remove. In Alexander Pope's 18th century translation, the illustrious chief of Troy reached down for his son, but the boy recoiled, cringing against his nurse's full breast, screaming out at the sight of his own father, terrified by the flashing bronze, the horsehair crest, the great ridge of the helmet, nodding, bristling terror. Here, so powerfully rendered, is one of the earliest recorded instances of war projecting its brutality, as David Grossman, the Israeli writer, put it, into the tender bubble of family. Sorry, the sorry truth of it is that our lamenting the poignancy of such scenes is as much a constant as the violence of war itself is, not just the works of Homer, but those of Goya, Tolstoy, Picasso, Wilfred Owen, Eric Maria Remarque, and Michael Hare spring to mind, so that it becomes hard not to conclude that whatever shame, pain, and outrage such works stir in their readers constitute, by and large, penance no more exacting than rites of confession in a Catholic church. Our heady undertaking of war, and then, afterwards, our hesitation before the horror it engenders, are integral but per perfunctory rites of passage in its age-old routine. Even with its destruction and carnage, writes Chris Hedges, and war is a force that gives us meaning, war can give us what we long for in life. It can give us purpose, meaning, a reason for living. The remorse that some, though far from all experience, the brief concession to repentant feeling is less likely to alter human behavior than to excuse it and permit another go. 
For a moment, we show ourselves to be human before repeating war's cycle of original insult, escalating injury, and then destruction, before fatigue sets in and peace has a tenuous, tenuous chance of taking hold again. We move through this cycle acceptingly because the majority considers the pursuit of war to be basic to human nature, evidence of the festering barbarity that burgeons in the jungle and that the 19th century scientists Thomas Henry Huxley and Charles Darwin believed was barely suppressed by civilization's delicate veneer. There are symptoms of the inalienable attributes of the forlorn species that American poet E.E. E. Cummings called in 1944 this busy monster, man unkind. Cummings, who enlisted with the Ambulance Corps in the First World War and was imprisoned by the French military for three and a half months on suspicion of espionage, though likely for his anti-war views, expressed his dissent fervently and angrily in the poem, I Sing of Olaf Glad and Big, Olaf, whose warmest heart recoiled at war, a conscientious objector, was an uncommon hero who paid for his obstinate, courageous stance. I will not kiss your fucking flag, he tells his commanding officer, a West Point colonel, defiantly, while his superiors, a yearning nation's blue-eyed pride, egged the first-class privates on, his rectum wickedly to tease by means of skillfully applied bayonets roasted hot with heat. Olaf, upon what were once knees, does almost ceaselessly repeat, there is some shit I will not eat. I sent um, these pages to one of our premier historians of the First World War, and I've kept uh, the post-its that he affixed to the manuscript because they provided, in a sense, permission for me to have done this book at all. Beside that little passage of, uh, of E. Cummings, a very famous poem, was a little sticky note saying, um, is there any evidence of this? And then, but my favorite was beside the, the, those few lines of, of Homer, um, in which, you know, describing uh, Hector coming back and his child bursting into tears, as you can imagine a child doing, uh, was a post-it note that said, I find this hard to believe. Surely the child would have seen soldiers before, uh, which I found very funny. Um, I thought, well, my God, if, if that's, if, if our great historians react to, um, to Homer in this way, wanting me to sort of see if I can check his facts, um, there is a place for some other point of view. Um, anyway, so, uh, that's really what I have to say. I want to um, I, I want to listen as much as you do to what the war resisters themselves have. Um, but I would say I would plead with you to just be conscious all the time of the ways in which we supersede ourselves. Um, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the cult of the hero, which is a necessary part of going to war. Adulation of people in uniform. I used to make a point of pointing out that some people. Um, are that in a sophisticated society, civilians can be heroes, and the woman who cleans Bay Street office towers at night in a non-union job and then goes back exhausted to drive her children to work, uh, to school, is also, in my mind, a hero. And that figure became very real in the part of Toronto I know in Cabbage Town when uh, the young, uh, the Somali uh, uh, mother of four that she was trying to bring over, Ms. Negret, uh, was murdered in a back alley. Um, those people exist. Um, and as I say, you know, this, uh, and these are heroes who are not in uniform, but, you know, our adulation, which is not to detract from the work that uh, good soldiers do, it's just to be alarmed at the way we um, can think emptily sometimes, continues, as I say, to supersede itself. I thought it reached a peak when 14,000 people turned out for Sergeant Ryan Russell's funeral in Toronto the same month that merely 600 did for the people who died on stage with Ge uh, Ge Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords in the United States. And then at the beginning of this week, I came back to Toronto and there was a picture on the front of the Toronto Star of members of the Kansas City football team with their hands on their hearts in a minute of silence for, um, for a teammate who had uh, murdered uh, a mother and uh, then killed himself. And, and um, I found this extraordinary um, that uh, there was a minute of silence at all, but we're allowing to do this as we get swept away in this whole cult of the hero in this sort of insecure world. So we have to be vigilant and do what we can. I hope I've done a little bit. Okay, thank you, and let's get back to your game.